Okay, Peter, I think you're free to continue. Oh, all right, so I'm already. So, okay, so last thing I did here was I uh, introduced the tensor product uh, on these mcomplete guys. And it's just, I mean, you follow your nose and you write down the definition. There's no surprise here. Um, but there is a surprise if you actually lead to classical root on banner spaces because you will realize that there's a whole zoo uh, of tensor products in banner spaces. So um, here's the classical. Uh, Yeah, the classical tensor product uh, of Banas. Uh, and these were, I guess, defined by Grotendieck in his early functional analysis days. And uh, he defined at least two, and sometimes even more, many more tensor products. The tensor product is it? Yes, it's a gentleman. Yeah. Um, uh, but let me like there's like a minimal choice for a tensor product and a maximal choice, and I only want to consider those. Those are some are also the most prominent in this theory. Um, so there is something called the projective tensor product. E tensor uh, pi w. And this is what you think is a tensor product should do, namely this represents bilinear maps to banners. But then he, there's another one. It's called the injective tensor product. Um, and this is actually slightly more subtle. Uh, um, but the only thing I want to say about it is that if you take the continuous functions, on something and take the injective tensor product, the continuous functions on some T. Then you end up with the continuous functions on S times. Which is not at all true uh, for the projective tensor product. So roughly what happens here is that for the projective tensor product, some of you allow a certain L1 bounded norms of some of elementary tensors and you allow much more general some of L infinity bounded norms of tensors here. And so uh, when I first learned that there are somehow several tensor products of final space, I got very confused. In particular, I also got very confused how to reconcile this with uh, what we're doing. Yeah, there's only like one canonical choice for what a tensor product should be. Um, but actually you can reconcile it uh, because, uh, uh, well, and the first is the following. So, uh, If you just take two Banach spaces and consider them as condensed R vector spaces, as M complete condensed R vector spaces, then you can form the complete tensor product in the sense of the previous proposition. And this is, turns out, is again a Banach space and is a projective tensor product of those. Okay, and um, <clears throat> this is a computation that's quite similar to a computation that Dustin did. So. Uh, and so, so this thing definitely recovers this projective tensor product. But on the other hand, um, we had this geology with Smith spaces, right? And so if V and W, uh, um, so they give rise to dual Smith spaces. And then To complete the tensor product of those is again a Smith space. And the dual is, is the injective tensor product. Um, 
And this is not quite true in general, it's almost true in general. So if one of V and W satisfies the approximation property. Uh, I don't want to recall what the approximation property is, but I do want to recall that it was taking a long time for people to find any Banner space that does not have this approximation property. So virtually all Banner space that ever appear, uh, if you ever care about, have the approximation property. Um, all right, and so <clears throat> this means that this injective tensor product is just what you get by taking the same tensor product on condensed, m-complete condensed R vector space, but just using it under the duality with Smith spaces. And uh, uh, this is some recovering that if you take, I mean, the continuous functions, they are dual to the measures on S is dual to the measures on T. And if you change the measures on S and on T, you of course, get the measures in S times T. All right. And so, uh, So you, you can, oh uh, yeah, you get these relations to these classical notions. Um, um, maybe one further thing. So uh, it's about the project of objects. In this category of incomplete. Um, well, let me just say in Smith space or something, when it's generating. So, so some of the this question, whether it's really any natural thing to somehow have these profile ad sets have anything to do with functional analysis. And so we were somehow basing now everything on these spaces of measures on profinite sets um, where we could also use compact cost spaces instead. So what are, what good are these profinite sets or what role actually do the extremely disconnected maybe say? Uh, yes, yes. The answer to Marco's question is yes. Um, so project of tender pro, uh, objects, I mean, at least it's true that it ex this is extremely disconnected. then this here is a project. And usually um, people care more about Banach than about uh, Smith spaces. So usually what uh, people study more is whether a Banach space is injective. And uh, dually some of the statements is that uh, this guy is injective. And an open question in Banach space theory is whether is any injective Banach space. Of this form. So yeah, so it's no example known of an injective Banach space. Um, that's not of the form continuous functions on some extremely disconnected set. And so this actually gives the extremely disconnected set some kind of actually uh, important role inside the, the theory of Banach spaces because they are at least very, very closely linked uh, to the injective Banach spaces. So in this sense, it's maybe a good sign that actually this category of profile sets or even of the exterior disconnected set actually does have a, some tight relation with functional analysis. Uh, um, but here is uh, the bad news. Um, if S1 and S2 are extremely disconnected and not finite, then, <clears throat> I mean, there's some other question 
whether the um, the compact projectives whether they are stable under the tensor product. And so this is a compact. This is some of what would be a projective in this category of incomplete guys. And we can tensor this with this one. So this measures uh, on this product. And this is never uh, projective again. So in particular, such a product of two extremely disconnected and infinite sets is never extremely disconnected itself again. And so even the weaker property, whether the space of measures is uh, projective, it turns out to be wrong. So, I mean, of course, classically this is stated as saying that the space, Banner space of continuous functions in this one sentence two is not an injective Banner space. <clears throat> uh, so I think this is due to Chembranos. this from the 1980 or something. <clears throat> okay. So, so uh, one thing we have to cope with uh, that we didn't have to cope with uh, over the periodic numbers or in, in the solid series is that here we are really in a setting where the tensor product of compact projectors will not be compact projective anymore. All right, but somehow we see that there is there is a tight relation between these extremely disconnected. So it seems that it's not all too unreasonable to somehow think that you know, it's actually a good idea to do this stuff. All righty. Um, okay. Okay. So. Uh, Okay, so, so far we neglected non quasi separated uh, spaces by fiat. But if you want an isobian category, you need to re, uh, need to allow them. Um, and so, I mean, another thing you would want of an isobian category is that uh, it's stable under extensions. And here's, here's another bad news. And that's even worse than maybe the previous bad news. Um, so this is just a fact of life that we have to cope with these bad news. The other is, well, it's also a fact of life, but we will uh, cheat our way around it in the end. Um, the category of M complete condensed other spaces is not stable under extensions. In fact, there are non-split extensions um, So this comes back to the question that Arthur asked about some of the higher X in this duality between Smith and Banner. So it can happen that we have non-trivial X groups between the space of measures uh, and the wheels for say. Uh, S is n union infinity. I mean, and basically all infinite real finite sets. Well, not all. Well, anyway, this one. Um, uh, <clears throat> so, 
So all such con con uh, things constructed. So there's this thing called the VBA extension. So this is classically an extension of uh, the L1 space uh, on the integers. As a real. And uh, um, and this is constructed as follows. So <clears throat> well no, let, let me let me let me do it for the space of measures instead there. Okay. So <clears throat> Uh, for some finite set S, uh, let me consider the following extension. So let me uh, extension for S and R of S. And so this will, well, it will be split, but uh, I want to, okay, so these are, it's one of two, sorry. I write in this form. And <clears throat> I think of ES as the following increasing union. Uh, so on the one hand, I want that the sum of the XSs is bounded. But on the other hand, I want that Y is close to the sum of XS times log of the absolute value of XS. Um, and the nice thing about this function here is that it is not additive uh, but locally close to additive locally almost in the sense that Uh, if I take x times log absolute value of x plus y times log absolute value of y minus x plus y times the log of the absolute value of x plus y. And this is less or equal to some, uh, something like two times the absolute value of, absolute value of y. Um, so up to something that's bounded in terms of the norm of x and y, uh, it's almost like a linear function. And so, yeah. Uh, um, so this means that if you uh, take, uh, so this is here is E S S equal to C. So this implies that E S less or equal to C plus E S less or equal to C is contained in. Es less or equal to, and then I don't know, maybe something like four C or something like this. So some universal constant times C. That's the only thing that's important. Um, and then for infinite S, um, we can define uh, the extension for S again as such union of all C greater than zero six tangent less or equal to C, where this thing is defined as a limit of all I of this extension, where it's less or equal to CI. Uh, sorry, S I and less or equal to C. And um, if I set it up right, then this would be compatible with transition maps and I'm not sure I've done it exactly right, but um, certainly for like S N union infinity, you can set it up in such a way that these transition maps here are basically compatible with transition maps. And so you can form such inverse limits here and then scale it out. And then because each of these intermediate things was somehow sitting in such an exact sequence, you can show that this is still an exact sequence uh, with a similar thing, which here gives you the space of measures if you forget about this y and then the kernel will be this. 
phi. So it will be the real numbers. So, so in fact, uh, one can show that for the for a Banach B, this is somehow. Um, locally almost linear maps. We to R modulo modulo globally almost linear. And here it's I guess X in topological vector spaces. Or something. I don't know. Uh, you're right. So this is not this is not X in Banach spaces, but in like um, uh, topological vector spaces. Yeah. Um, so you can construct certain weird extensions of Banach spaces <coughs> uh, if you find locally almost linear maps from your Banach spaces wheels so that are not globally almost linear. Uh, and the idea is somehow that on any bounded subset, somehow you can make this linear, and then you, this gives you some uh, splitting of this. Um, but if it's only locally almost linear, then globally you can't find the splitting, and this somehow more or less what happens in this. Yeah. This, the point is that the entropy function x max to x times log here to the of x that we somehow used. Uh, used in here is an example of such a locally almost linear function that's not globally almost linear. And yeah, using this function, you can build such funny extensions uh, like so. Um, so, So this is some kind of classical fact that was discovered, I don't know, uh, I think this is from the, uh, the 70s. Uh, that was discovered in the 70s that you can find, have these, <coughs> these weird things where, uh, yeah, the extensions are not locally convex anymore. So non-locally convex extensions of locally convex. Uh, vector spaces. <clears throat> and so this means that the setting of local convexity, you can't use this as some as a primitive thing if you want a really nice to be in category. You because by extensions you can leave the setting, you have to uh, somehow start right off in a setting where you allow non-locally convex things. And so uh, what people do classically in functional analysis is this, uh, um, is they go to P Banach spaces where P is possibly less than one. So there's this following definition. So you have a, the notion of a P Banach space, so it's a topological R vector space V such that there exists a P norm P from the real is greater or equal to zero to um, right uh, such that I mean basically you have exactly the same conditions as for um, for a banner particular it's uh, separated so a vector is zero if and only if it is norm zero um, um it satisfies the triangle inequality uh, it defines the topology so set of all e such that the normal fees less than epsilon uh, is the basis of the neighborhood of zero. Um, it's complete. 
and then there's one condition that's different, namely what happens if you scale by a scalar. Then usually you would ask that this uh, is the absolute value of a times a norm of v. But here you uh, rescale the norm and it's uh, the absolute value to the p times the norm of v. So an example would be like, I don't know, LP of n. So this is those sequences. So that's the norm of a n to the p, it's finite. And yeah, and with this thing as a norm. Uh, note that <clears throat> if p is less or equal to one, then this thing still satisfies the triangle inequality. Satisfies the usual triangle. Well, this will be important later again. <clears throat> uh, so, so the only thing that's different with this norm uh, is that uh, this is scaling behavior here. Uh, Right, so these are things that are not locally convex. This is not local. So P does not uh, That's because uh, if you somehow if you have uh, integers, I don't know, if you have a half, comma a half. So if you want to take the middle point of two points, then this will actually get larger. You might think that this is in contradiction to the triangle inequality. But when you want to say that the midpoint of or between so v plus w half is at most the absolute value of v plus the absolute value of w half, uh, which you would like to say, then you would also use in addition to the triangle inequality the scaling behavior, but the scaling behavior is different, right? And so this is why the midpoint of something of two points that are small can suddenly be larger. Okay. Uh, so some remarks, so uh, if P prime is less than P, then P Banach implies P prime Banach. So there are more and more of these guys as you go closer to zero. Um, we just take a norm and map it to the same norm, but then to the P prime over P power, which will still do the job. And note that the norm was not part of the data. It was only that there exists such a norm. Yeah? So the data was just a topological object. Uh, and then, so I think these are traditionally called quasi banners, are they not? Which is now in conflict with the terminology from the morning. So, uh, Justin? Uh, Q Bonnock stood for quotient of Bonnock in the morning. Maybe, did yeah. I accidentally say quasi at one point? Q, but uh, it was only Q banner. It didn't yeah. say quasi banner. I always thought it was meant quasi banner. It stood for quotient oh, it, of banner. It's okay. Yeah. I think you sometimes said quasi. No, I might have, I apologize, yeah. Okay, uh, and so then uh, there's a notion of a quasi banner. Uh, this is P banner for some penis. And then, I mean, this is a setting that's not been considered too much in classical, fu classical function analysis, but it has been considered in particular by Carl Tong. And so one theorem that Carl Tong proved in, in the 80s. Um, is that an extension of p-banners Is P prime banner? Well, it's not for, it's not P banner itself. So some of the same phenomena that we had for banner still exists in P banners, but it's P banner for all P prime less than P. And so, uh, yeah. if you somewhat don't insist that it's P banner for a specific P, but that it's only 
like less than p banner, then this is something that's stable under extending. So, so <clears throat> particular if you you can ask that you can replace local complexity by less than one banners. I mean, those that are p banner for all p strictly less than one, that's okay. But asking that they're banners, that's not okay. Um, right. Uh, okay. And so, <clears throat> So this suggests the following modification. Of these spaces of measures that we considered previously. So recall that this was a union over all C greater than zero of this unit for I, R minus I, as the L1 norm is also equal to C. So we can define the P measures. Measure P. Sorry, can you unmute yourself? I that was my bad. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we don't want to hear this idiot anymore. Shut up. <laughs> no, no, I I I apologize. This was next <laughs> okay. Uh, it even happens to the president of the United States. So. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so instead, we do the same thing where we uh, take uh, the LP norm that's equal to C here. Um, so uh, this somehow corresponds exactly, I mean, if we would do a finite replace n by a finite set here that's some of the same uh, condition as here in particular because uh, this still satisfies the usual triangle inequality you see that um, the transition maps here which are some kind of uh, adding some stuff uh, um, they uh, they still respect this inequality here so Note that this only happens if p is at most one. So if it I took p larger than one, then the transition maps wouldn't uh, preserve the subset here. Um, right, but it works here. And uh, so these are again some compact host of sets, which are some of p convex, where p is less than they are not convex, and then takes the limit, and then you scale it out. And okay, so this would somehow. <clears throat> Be some kind of Smith space version of a, of a P banner. Uh, but note that uh, in the setting where you're not locally convex anymore, the Hahn banner theorem fails. Uh, and uh, so in particular, there's no the dual can be zero of a p bar of a p banner p is less than one. You don't have enough functionals anymore, so there's no duality anymore between p banners and p p Smith spaces or anything like that. Um, the duality doesn't work at all anymore. But you can still have some uh, things generated by compact p convex sets such as these guys. Okay, and. Um, and let me also do, introduce less than p measures um, to be just a union over all p prime less than p. Just p prime measures. Okay, and so this still comes. The free R guy still maps to here by uh, Dirac.
<clears throat> and then the big theorem is that uh, sending any of these guys to the space of less than P measures. Uh, defines a, a, a functor L uh, satisfying distance axes. Uh, right, the so union, I mean, all the transition maps here are injective. And one way to see that they're injective is to note that all of these guys uh, sit inside. I mean, you can remove the subscript here and then they sit inside the limit of the uh, arc ring as well. <clears throat> so in particular, what does this mean? So. We can say that a condensed R vector space P is P liquid to zero if S and P is equal to one. If the following equivalent conditions hold. So that's always the same. Uh -huh. One is to say that for all P prime S and P and all maps from S and to B, there exists unique extension F tilde to the space of P prime measures. Uh, a different way to say it is that uh, for all maps from some profinite set into V. There exists a unique extension, well, all the way up to the space of S and P measures. In those case extensions of that. <clears throat> uh, so this was uh, this one characterization that Dustin gave that um, the ones that lie in this full subcategory are somewhat generated by these things are then the ones where any map from these guys extends to here. Um, and then there was this kind of different description uh, that it's somehow the category generated by those. And one way to say that is that uh, B can be written as a core kernel of the map. Uh, from some direct sum of the ring S and P measures and some PJs. Direct sum S and P measures and some S. And um, so we have this category of I don't know, P liquid R modules inside of condensed R modules. And then this has left adjoint. There's a tensor product, liquid tensor product. Tensor product, um, everything passes to derived categories. Uh, and yeah. And you have all these good properties. I mean, Dustin was giving this very long statement of what all the formal consequences. Um, so there was a question whether this is not the same for all P and no, it's not at all. I mean, <clears throat> like if you're P liquid with say P is one, then this is something like, like a less than one banner. So, so P liquid, they contain the less than P banners. But just like there's some kind of strict 
hierarchy of the less than p banners, there are some strict hierarchy of the liquid ones. So there's some funny thing here that like in the non-arc median world, there was a completely canonical choice for your series given by the solid being groups and like pretty clear that this is what you want to do. Well, the real number, it turns out that there is not this one distinguished theory, but there's a whole family of them parameterized by uh, the real number to, between zero and one. And uh, but Peter, you mean that it contains the greater than or equal to P Bonox, right? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Thank you. But not the less than P Well, it contains a P Bonox, okay. Yeah, yeah. And it contains the tangent of P Bonox and so on, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I got it mixed up. Uh, well, no, I mean, sorry, by less than p banners, I meant those that are the p prime banner for all p prime less than p uh, in the same way that I used it, that I used it uh, here. So here, less than p banner meant it's p prime banner for all p prime less than p. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah I was just. Uh... Uh, yeah, um, sorry, I mean, I, I agree. I was also confused by my own notation right now, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, right. Uh, okay. <clears throat> okay, so. So the goal, so I want to explain a little bit about how to uh, somehow I start maybe today, talk, talk a little bit about this and then uh, tomorrow I will continue some explanations about this to uh, show that this is a, what goes into the proof of the theorem. Um, but let me first explain a little bit why, what, what the difficulty is that you encounter. So, So we need to prove uh, that for all, well, that for all p liquid ones, but in particular, say for all p banners, and actually you can more or less re reduce to those uh, for all p banners, p the R harm from the space of P prime measures. So P prime is something like, uh, <clears throat> so uh, you want to show that whenever you have a map from the free guy uh, on some profinite set, the free condensed guy. I mean, all arms are taken over R, of course. Um, <clears throat> any such map extends uniquely uh, to the space of P prime measures. And you want to show this, well, not just on homes, but in, on the R homes, in fact, on the internal R homes. Uh, Yeah, sorry, I mean, there's still some confusion about the inclusions here. So you should think about that uh, this the setting that's closest to usual function analysis, it's closest to the locally convex setting, is if you take p equal to one, then you're almost asking that things are locally convex, but still not quite because you're only somehow less than one uh, for all measures, p prime measures, but p prime is less than one, you ask for this completeness. And so these are things that are almost locally convex. And then if, as you decrease P, you allow more and more non-convexity in your, to your spaces. Um, so basically, uh, all right, so somehow, if you would let P go to, to zero in this business here, then somehow if you're asking that the L zero norm is less than equal to the constant, then you're basically asking that there are only finitely many uh, entries that are non-zero at all. And so you're basically reduced to some, some coordinate axis. And then the limit here would just be the usual uncompleted R join S. And, yeah. So somehow as you increase, yeah, maybe I should draw a picture. So how do, do these things look like? So, I mean, if P is equal to one, then we had uh, this picture. 
But then maybe I can use a color. Then as it gets smaller, you somehow, uh, <clears throat> it uh, cuts inwards. And then uh, if you're very, very small, then you somehow stay very, very close to these coordinate hyperplanes. You just have some very, very, I don't know. You don't add some or much into your free, uh, free into, uh, into these spaces of measures. You somehow don't add all too much. You somehow add some sums here in the middle, but somehow, let's see, make pieces smaller and smaller. And suddenly, you somehow only end up with the finite linear combinations. Okay, so the key statement you actually need to prove, and uh, I mean, it's not too hard to reduce to this statement here that um, whenever you have a P banner, uh, then yeah, the maps from R join S to V join uh, extend to the space of P prime measures, but internally and derived. <clears throat> And uh, so we need to compute something like this. I mean, I mean the right-hand side, it's clear what it is, right? It's basically just the, the S value point of V. So that the right-hand side is easy. In particular, this is concentrated in degree zero, yeah? Um, and somehow it's just a continuous function from S to V. Uh, a priori only uh, without the underline, but uh, yeah. No, no, even without the under, with the underline. So the thing is that on oh, profinite set, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's yeah. a banner, yeah. It's a banner. Yes, yeah, so S is a profinite set here, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But this is yeah. This was not obvious. To, yeah. I'm not saying every not everything I'm saying is supposed to be obvious, but I'm saying it's relatively easy. Yeah. Uh, so the thing is that you need to compute this side, in particular, you need to see that there are no higher x. So yeah. you need to compute this. Uh, and uh, one to one x. <clears throat> okay, and so something you can do is uh, so you have this some space like that. So it's a Smith space. So in particular, it has like this uh, compact convex subs. Uh, well, not convex, but this compact. P prime convex subset generating it. And then you can like take the free Z or R vector space as you as you wish um, on this S or equal to one. And this will be a surjection. So this, uh, this in here is a compact cluster. And so, <clears throat> So this would be like one of the basic objects where we might have a chance to understand what's happening. And then um, uh, so there's a version of the Brina lean resolution uh, that works here. It's basically the Brina the lean resolution, except that I'm also introducing some cutoffs here. And uh, there's a small argument that you can do this. Uh, and maybe for a specific cutoff, it's not really resolution, but I have to, it's kind of int resolution, but anyway, that's not the real problem. So you can resolve, basically resolve this by things which are the free guys on some compact cost of things, and you can be more or less explicit of what, what these things are uh, because it's some kind of green lean resolution. So again, the green lean resolution is not quite explicit, but maybe it's explicit enough for what you're trying to do. Um, but the real problem is the following. In a real problem is the following. So if P is a P banner, uh, where P is less than one, and uh, T, which I mean, this would be my T now, is a compact cost of guy, then we still need to compute the X here. But uh, If you're trying to compute on such a compact host of the cohomology of such a V, uh, 
then we have no idea how to compute this and it's uh, probably uh, non-zero for all right. Note that uh, the compact Hausdorff spaces that we care about, they are very, very much infinite dimensional because I mean, the space of measures is some infinite dimensional uh, real vector space. And so this is some huge compact Hausdorff space. Um, and if it was pro-finite, then you could still show that it, uh, the same argument as I gave for the real numbers still shows that this sits in degree zero. It's just given by the continuous functions. But if it's a general compact Hausdorff thing, then <clears throat> The argument I use there for the real numbers, it's used critically local convexity because of these uh, partitions of unity. But this does not work anymore at all for P one of this piece less than one. And so I'm pretty sure that this cohomology group, it will sit all over the place. And it's impossible to compute this. So we expect. Uh, that one cannot control this. And so, so to uh, do this computation of this R home of the space of P prime measures against such a P band, we really had to come up with new techniques. So you might think that. I know this feels like a functional analysis question, right? I mean, this is a nice topological vector space. This is a nice topological vector space. You put it into this condensed framework and they just ask what the X groups are. This shouldn't be too complicated, right? But uh, I mean, the condensed framework tells us in principle how to compute it. And somehow you have to compute it more or less in this way, but then you run into problems, you can't do this. So, <clears throat> so you really have to resolve By R join T's uh, with T pro finite. So, so you want to explicitly or sufficiently explicitly uh, resolve real vector spaces. By real vector spaces. Pro finite space. I mean, that's not what you have to do if you want to compute this X group in condensed uh, R vector spaces. So, and now we're somehow squarely back into the discussion at the beginning. So we want to do something over the real numbers, but the condensed framework is somehow very much based on profinite sets. And so it seems incompatible to do stuff over the real numbers, but base everything on profinite sets. And here we are finally at the point where we have to, we have to address this problem. Uh, okay. And uh, yeah, so let me just give you the teaser for tomorrow. So the way out uh, is exactly to write R in this uh, form that I stated in the beginning as some kind of ring of some convergent power series, Laurent power series over the integers, module, I don't know, T minus the tens or whatever. Or whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter what you put here. Um, well, I guess also this is not really an element in the ring. I should guess I should write 10 t minus one. Uh, uh, where this here is some kind of union of profinite sums. And then Define an analogous uh, liquid theory in this arithmetic setting. And then execute the intended strategy. So 
So once you switch to this ring instead, uh, what will happen is that when you do the analogous, analogous thing here is that these guys, these compact host of things that are generating this one, they will themselves be profinite. Uh, just because some of the ring is some profinite ring uh, or, or union of profinite things. And so, so then, you, yeah, this issue doesn't appear. You can actually explicitly say, uh, compute the X groups of all these three guys. And then you get some re reasonably explicit complex that you still have to understand. It. It's still a lot of work to actually do the computation then, but at least it's, you have a chance of understanding what the terms are. Uh, and so I find it really striking that to prove the theorem about the real numbers, you actually have to prove some arithmetic statement. You actually have to prove something over the integers. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, there are only four minutes left. So uh, yeah, I think I'll just stop here. Maybe there are some questions. I can see. Okay.